Hello and welcome everyone to our CDI Laser Fish webinar titled, I Love to Hate You, Our Five Most Important Workarounds. My name is Kyle Niebel from CDI here, and I've been a technical trainer and consultant for quite a few years at CDI and uh, worked with Laserfish for many years prior to that as well. Looking forward to go through in, going through some of these uh, topics here. Uh, this session is being recorded, so uh, there will be a recording posted on our YouTube channel when that is available and ready. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance, and why don't we go ahead and get started. So, uh, like I said, I'm our technical trainer here at CDI. Glad to have you all here. Some of you I've already met, some I have not, but I look forward to meeting you uh, in the very near future. Today's topics for our workarounds uh, are the following five topics. One, we have um, ways to promote workflows and forms into production. Many times we'll build workflows or forms um, for testing, but then we want to bring them into a production environment. And there are some ways to do that, and we're going to cover that briefly in a uh, demonstration. Uh, and we'll be demonstrating, or I'll be demonstrating, all these topics as well uh, live here in our session. And I encourage you to ask questions in the question box in the meeting area if you have any questions. And uh, we'll address them uh, either as we go or at the end of the session, uh, whichever works. Uh, the second topic is setting your scan settings uh, and the differences between Twain versus Scan Connect. Uh, we'll talk about Scan Connect if you've ever even heard of it, uh, and Twain as well. Uh, then we'll cover how we prevent runaway workflows. A pretty simple solution, but one that we use quite a bit. Uh, then we'll talk about how we could prevent bots from logging into our public portal documents and therefore preventing uh, uh, the site being locked up with a user that is basically crawling the site. So we don't want to have that happen, so we have a way to do that. And then finally, we will take a look at how we use workflow activities to uh, set or unset cutoffs of records that have been set in that for those who are doing records management but want to use an automated way to do that, we can use workflow. All right, so our first topic is promoting workflows or forms to production. And there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, first off, let's take a look at a workflow import wizard. And then after that, we'll take a look at a forms upload wizard uh, to see how that works. So on our system, uh, a workflow might be uh, provided to you. You might have been uh, given a workflow file that you need to import into the production workflow system, or you've got a test system that you built it on, you export the workflow file, and then you can bring it into workflow. In fact, I have this workflow file right here. And if you drop it into uh, anywhere on the workflow designer tool, or just double click the workflow file itself, LaserFeed's workflow will launch a wizard. And the wizard is going to walk us through some interview questions. Now that workflow file might have come from a different system and it has a different connection profile. So you can then choose to configure and use your own connection profile for this particular production environment. And then having selected that, you might need to make some changes on the templates um, or workflows. Uh, this actual workflow file has quite a few workflows built into it. Uh, this actually comes from Laserfish. You can download this uh, set of templates from Laserfish and your choice for any of the uh, workflows. If you only had one workflow, there would only be one workflow listed here. And then you have a choice of actions uh, as to how you want to import that particular workflow. For example, you might want to do a rename uh, and publish. And if you do rename it, you want to give it a different name here with the publish as option just to the right of the rename and publish action. Uh, having done that, uh, we'll do that. Now I'm going to say no to all the others here so that uh, not all of them come in, right? We don't want to bring in all of them unless we really do, but I've already done that once, so I don't need to bring them in again. All right, so we'll disable that. Um, 
notice we have several different options, including open without publishing. So you could take a look at it, but not really save it into your repository. Uh, I'm gonna say don't publish, and that will be the same. And then we're just gonna rename a uh, workflow here and go ahead and click next. Uh, for this workflow, uh, we have a starting rule that it also is looking at. And that start rule, which would trigger this workflow, uh, can be imported or not. You have another option down here in the second box that uh, allows you to uh, either rename it, publish it, or don't publish it. And then uh, that workflow start rule for this workflow will be available as well. Uh, typically, we'll do that. You can also check the box for enabling the workflow. And uh, that's always handful, uh, handy as well. All right. Uh, and then finally, once you've made those selections, you can click the finish button and that workflow and its start rule will be imported uh, based on the selections you've made through this wizard. And then you can choose to open the imported workflow and take a look at that. All right. And when you hit finish, it just drops that workflow in and should take you to the rule manager in the workflow designer. As you can see, it's importing and publishing. Now, what it's really doing in the background is pushing all this information to the workflow database that's in the background in which all this information is stored. And then if you go to the rule manager, you'll uh, be able to see anything that's in here with enabled rules or with, in this case, uh, I did not enable the start rule. So it'd be listed under the with no enabled rules uh, area and we'll expand that. All right, so that's the workflow import wizard. That's a great workaround for uh, promoting uh, our test workflow into a production workflow. Um, in regards to forms, uh, there's a forms promotion tool that we could do as well. Uh, for example, if you've been provided a new forms uh, process that's built by somebody and then you've been provided that forms business process XML file, uh, new in version 11 is a forms promotion wizard that didn't exist prior to version 11. It's really cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose a solution template to give you an example of the import wizard. For example, uh, let's say we need to do a new business process uh, or this new file that we've been provided is uh, a travel reimbursement process. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is kind of built in, but let's say it's not built in and we uh, are uploading the file. Uh, in this example, normally we would go into our designer and go to management. For example, you could go to the manage tab in LaserFish Forms. and thinking about it here give it a moment and within the manage screen it's thinking hard there it is on the green button in the top right corner you can hit the drop down and you can then upload that process file by dropping it into the box here which then will launch the same wizard that we'll see here and i'm just going to get right around that one by clicking on the import process and at this point right here this is the new promotion wizard uh, for forms. Uh, didn't really used to be here, but it's pretty cool. If there's any configurations in the imported process that are different, uh, and we have different users, and we have different uh, LaserFish repositories, those can all be configured here. In fact, uh, we have some different names, and if you want to just replace the names, type in a user account that you want to replace. It could be your account, uh, and then just pick those names to be replaced. And you don't have to replace them, but uh, uh, they'll end up being uh, something you'll configure in the process designer later on. Uh, for certain um, emails, there's an email process in here that uh, we need to set uh, and configure an email system. Or if we leave it empty for this particular promotion, um, it would use our own LaserFish Forms configured email properties. All right, so that's users and group settings. And then as you can see up at the top, there's some uh, steps as that it will take us through. And we're currently on the user setting. Uh, we might look at data sources if there was one configured uh, for lookup rules. 
Sometimes our forms will look up data in a database and if that data source is different than ours, we need to configure that. So that'll be the next step. And in this case, this workflow, or sorry, this forms process did not have that uh, any data sources at all. So we have zero to even configure. If we did, we would have to change our pointers to a different database uh, server and give it the credentials that we would log into that database server with. Uh, then we would go next. It's going to review any of the resources uh, that we might be connecting to. Uh, if the process had a call to a workflow, we might need to update uh, our workflow names, uh, file storage location if the forms process is accepting file uploads. Uh, so those file uploads could be stored either in the database or the forms database, that is, or on a file system but that's configured separately from the forms process. But if we have it on our system, we do need to define that. If you're using pay payment gateways, you can configure that for your environment, change your logos if those were configured in the theming of your form, and any web hooks or connections to web uh, services might be reconfigured. And then the repository profile down here, this is actually uh, indicates that there's a store to laserfish repository action in the process itself. And then you want to make sure that you edit it and are able to use the, um, as you can see, the task is in here saved uh, to repository. And you'll need to edit the profile to connect to your laserfish repository uh, because this one was some, probably slightly different and not your own. All right. So some of these properties are going to be. Um, one or more may be something you'll use uh, an update others may not uh, typically at, at minimum you're going to edit your repository profile and make sure that the profile is no longer um, your the uh, defined one you'll replace the repository name make sure that your username and password are verified and will work as you import this process and if you get a checkbox that means it's all good oh please thank you uh, LastPass. And then finally, uh, if there are any pre-built reports in this process as well, we could uh, make sure that those are configured with the correct recipients if there are any recipients in the automated uh, reporting capabilities of this process. And finally, you'll just hit the upload button and that'll bring you into the design mode in LaserFiche Forms. Uh, if I do that, it'll begin the creation process bring all that in, take us into designer, and we're good to go. Uh, that should disappear as well. And as you can see, it's launching the designer. And then you can proceed with your forms design. All right, so that was promoting workflows and forms into a production environment. Very easy to use those wizards, uh, makes life really easy, and uh, we use those all the time and I recommend you do too. All right, the next topic is setting scan settings in Twain versus Scan Connect. What is Scan Connect? Well, Scan Connect is a LaserFish product that is a licensed product that um, existed many years ago because a lot of times the scanner hardware back in the day, and we're talking more like 20 years ago, uh, didn't use USB uh, high-speed connections. They had to use a really thick big cable um, that connected to a card that was plugged into your computer. Uh, not like today, which everything is just plug and play, easy peasy. Uh, back then you had to have a uh, scanner card with a big connector cable to the scanner device itself, and it used this scanning software that uh, was called ISIS drivers, ISIS, uh, Image Scan Interface uh, specification is what that stood for. <laughs> Not that you want to remember that, um, but uh, those scanners would then be connected and we would use laserfish scanning and the source would be Scan Connect. Uh, so you'd install your uh, scanner drivers, then you'd install Scan Connect and it would uh, kind of stand in between laserfish scanning and the scanner and allow us to configure the uh, source and even some of the uh, page size configurations. Uh, and that kind of 
disappeared around the year 2012. Uh, it supports uh, most scanners built uh, prior to that, but maybe even 2008 if you want to be safe. Uh, but anything after you know 2023 or 2020, uh, sorry, 20, 2004 or 2003, uh, a lot of um, the newer scanners were USB capable and had Twain software, T-W-A-I-N. Stands for technology without an interesting name. Kid you not, that's what it stands for, but it's for scanner drivers. And this is uh, the most common and preferred method uh, nowadays for connecting our scanners to LaserFish. <clears throat> now LaserFish does also give you an option for the Windows Image Acquisition or WIA drivers, but uh, it's only recommended for flatbed scanners. Uh, Twain is a more powerful, more configurable piece of software and uh, we can do that. So if you had Scan Connect when you uh, had it powered on and you basically were selecting the scanner source, uh, you'd uh, select Scan Connect, which then would bring up the scanner selection option that we see on the left image here. And if your scanner software wasn't installed, you could add it or set it up, or if you'd already run the install, but you need to configure it, you could add that scanner uh, from the list and then it would be available, and then you could configure the device, which would be listed, and then you can set the default page size and a few other settings. But once you've done this, LaserFish scanning would come into play um, as normal. So once you've got these Twain settings or Scan Connect settings, it was a little different. Twain uh, skipped all this Scan Connect uh, steps, and if we look at LaserFish scanning, We'll go ahead and launch the scanning on this machine. And as you would launch scanning, you'd need to configure a scan source. So as you can see in my drop-down list, you might have Scan Connect. Now, if you don't see Scan Connect, that means you don't have Scan Connect installed. And these days, it's really not totally required. But in either case, whether you had chosen Scan Connect or Twain, Scan Connect adds a couple steps in addition, but Twain is our preferred method these days, but either way, once you've done the configuration uh, and chosen your device, and uh, my device is on, uh, just say OK on that scanner, and then LaserFish's scan module would come up, and then you can set the appropriate paper size, paper source, and color. Uh, I'll set letter size because we're here in America, not in Europe. Uh, A4 is the equivalent to letter size here in America, but it's uh, A4 in Europe. Uh, paper source, one would configure as uh, feeder or duplex. Uh, feeder is um, single-sided, duplex is double-sided, and you can set up properties and image processing uh, settings to remove um, blank pages if you do set your scanning for duplex. All right. Um, and then black and white uh, is our default selection for color. It's recommended uh, because it's more efficient. Uh, it's about one-tenth the size of a grayscale or color page. Color page um, is, or grayscale, is going to be about near about one megabyte per scanned page, whereas black and white is going to be maybe 150K. So as you can see, quite a bit more efficient and better for storage. All right, we do have a question on the scanning program. Uh, sometimes errors out in locking computer. Um, asking if LaserFish is going to do any uh, rewrite of this anytime soon on the uh, software. Well, the scanning module is, uh, yes, it is kind of separate from the client, although you do launch it from the client and is part of the LaserFish Windows client install. Now, you could also run LaserFish scanning, the module you see here, if you have the web client, uh, but it is a download um, and can be launched, and then it just stores documents into the LaserFish repository. Uh, is LaserFish going to rewrite this interface? Not sure. <clears throat> uh, if you're running a newer version, uh, as always, LaserFish support will, uh, and we here at CDI will recommend that you uh, update to the latest version of the client that you can. If your LaserFree server is uh, not up to date, uh, that's uh, something you should take advantage of, as long as all your LaserFish support uh, packages are, and support maintenance fees are up to date, 
you can update your servers at any time and we can help you plan and uh, help you get that upgraded uh, at any time for no charge. Um, and then your client could be upgraded and this module will be updated. So they do update the scanning module with the um, client, but this interface has not changed that much in the last few years, uh, although they do make patches and fixes and updates uh, for anything that's been reported to them. So I would definitely recommend upgrading as soon as you can. Uh, latest version is version 11.0.2. So 11.0 is really it with a sub uh, of dot two. All right, so that is um, how we deal with Scan Connect versus Twain. I would recommend if you've got a newer scanner that's using USB, <clears throat> you don't have to use Scan Connect. Um, so better to use Twain. Uh, Scan Connect did give you some options uh, that Twain wouldn't. Uh, however, these days, um, for example, you might be using a product from a company called Cofax called VRS or Virtual Rescan. It's a software that helps pretty up the image pages and you can see that listed in your scan source as well. Uh, and sometimes you did need Scan Connect to do that. Nowadays, uh, you really don't. <clears throat> um, for those who have uh, a scanner, let's say you have a Fujitsu or a, a Panasonic or a Canon, and you want to use Twain drivers, these manufacturers all have different drivers. They probably, you might have installed it with the ISIS drivers back in the day, um, but if that scanner is still in production or uh, whatnot, you might want to go to their website and look for their scanner drivers and look for the Twain drivers. You can install those. And that software, the Twain software, sits in between um, and will talk to the scanner on behalf of the laser vision scanning module. So the um, manufacturers certainly will be providing both if it supports it. All right. So hopefully you can find a Twain driver for your scanner. Um, the ISIS drivers are if you're using a, a really old scanner. I mean, we're talking probably at this point and you're 20 years old. Uh, but uh, most newer scanners do not require ISIS drivers. Uh, but theoretically, if you want high throughput, that's why people did that. So, uh, but uh, with a USB 3.0 connection, that whole issue has gone away. So modern technology, we love it. And that's how uh, things go forward there. All right, so that is uh, our uh, look at Twain versus Scan Connect. <clears throat> All right, next subject is preventing runaway workflows. So in LaserFish workflow, we want to make sure that a, another workflow that we built uh, doesn't call a second workflow and cause that workflow to start and then uh, potentially copy files or uh, create entries in the system that eventually clog up the log files or create so much data and or copies of documents that we crash our server. Uh, I did have a client who did that many years ago. They hadn't had this class or any of our workflow training classes, but uh, the best way to prevent a workflow that uh, might be triggered on uh, a set of rules is to make sure that the workflow user itself is not um, uh, listened to. In other words, if anything is done by workflow, tell workflow to ignore that and, and not start. And you can see a screenshot of that in here. In our start rules, when we build a workflow, if this workflow is called by another workflow, that's something different. But uh, for any workflow that is triggered by a start rule, maybe a document gets created in a folder, and then this workflow gets triggered, we want to make sure that the workflow uh, only starts because a actual user did something. If workflow itself put this document in here or moved it, that's probably something different. So we want to make sure that this workflow doesn't start. And the best way to do that is, as we can see here, for any event type, you can set at minimum. And you should also certainly have other start rules built in. 
but the one that is my favorite and I recommend you use at all times, even if you don't think it's necessary, um, for entries being created or moved into a particular path, uh, add the particular condition we see here, which says user does not equal your workflow account. All right, so let's take a look and see what that uh, actually looks like. And in workflow, we'll take a look and we'll open up one of our workflows. Uh, take a look. Uh, do I have, uh, whoops, I've got my huge list. Um, there's a workflow. Uh, let's open up our, or add a starting rule. And having gotten past the start rule, we are now into the creation wizard. And normally you'll have a few rules. Uh, sometimes it's the uh, entry template, it has to be a particular template, right? Um, and it's a certain path is set. But then within this, I always add the user. So notice in the first green drop down, there's a choice called user. Uh, you can also do users groups, but I usually use this one. Uh, for this particular rule and choose user and then change that to does not equal and then you've got a workflow account that's been created it's usually a service account um, in your list of laserfish users within your admin console so if you um, want to make sure that you've got your uh, account there i'm going to log into my admin console real quick and just make sure that I know my name of my workflow service account. Go ahead and log in. Go to users and groups. Click on repository users. And this repository has a, an account called WF. It could be workflow. It could be WF agent. Could be workflow agent. Could be whatever you called it. Uh, usually you don't want to use the admin account as your workflow account. Now this workflow account, remember, is uh, set up as we can see here it does not use a license it's not a repository named user but it becomes one when using it with workflow so the beauty is you can say user does not equal and then whatever that name is put that name in there and this tells laserfish workflow to ignore the starting of that workflow because it was done by somebody else you, an end user might have put a document into the folder and that's what we want to trigger on not workflow putting it there because workflow could be putting a document or creating a document in that folder but that's going to be a different process all right so this prevents uh, what I would also call infinite loops um, so that it doesn't uh, keep building and uh, doing its thing even though it might be triggering a different workflow that comes back and triggers this workflow and as you can see that cycle could be really bad so we don't want to do that all right uh, and then just publish as normal uh, within your rules but add the user does not equal and then your workflow service account name and you are going to be a very happy camper because you'll never have a runaway workflow all right great stuff there uh, highly recommended and one that we always uh, add to all of our workflows and uh, i think uh, you'd be well served if you went back and reviewed some of your workflow start rules and made sure that you don't have, uh, or you add that in there on any of those that you see fit. All right, uh, next topic is how do we prevent bots from logging into public document portals? This is actually in reference to uh, Laserfish Weblink. Uh, so we're gonna need some information about our Weblink site and uh, do that. So the first question is, what's a bot and what is, and then we use a special um, uh, technique uh, that uses a robots.txt file uh, that uh, we apply in the website. And this is an industry standard. This isn't just Laserfish uh, creating this. This is out there for all websites. And you can do it for any website, uh, but in our case, we're going to talk about Weblink. And we'll create a text file called, called robots.txt. Uh, we'll add some syntax to that file. Uh, they call them rules. And uh, we'll put it at the root of the installed website. I'll show you what that looks like for Weblink. And then we want to test to make sure that the file is accessible on our site. And I'll show you that steps as well. So how do we know what our 
Weblink site file path is? Well, we're going to use Microsoft's IIS Manager to do that. And then we're also going to edit that text file. Uh, and Windows has a built-in text file, and that's all you need, unless you have a preferred text editor that's different. So um, what is the robots.txt uh, file, and how did it ever come into being? Well, it's uh, it allows us to implement what the industry calls the robots exclusion protocol, which is a standard used by websites to indicate to a visiting web crawler and other web bots as to which portions of the site they are allowed to visit, if at all. So if you prevent this a bot from, it, and what it does is most bots will look for this file before it even tries to do anything, and it ignores it. If it's a, if it's a nice bot, um, it will ignore that. Uh, now, this is strictly voluntary compliance. There might be bots that uh, don't follow this rule and might even um, uh, use this bot to figure out where to go. Uh, so buyer beware, so to speak. Uh, so that's some of the things. Uh, there are some limits. Uh, this um, text file, uh, not all search engines may be supported. Uh, with the rules that are in this robots.txt file uh, and different uh, web bots and web crawlers interpret syntax differently. So you might have to have different syntax in there. Uh, we don't have time or um, this is not really the place to talk about all those different syntaxes. You'll see one example here today, but you can find the, this information on the internet very easily. Uh, Google is probably one of the more common places to find it, but there's other web crawlers. so find out those by searching. Um, and the page or site that is disallowed in the robots.txt file could still be indexed if it's linked to from other sites that don't have a prevention built into the uh, robots.txt file. Okay, so just some caveats in there. And then like I said, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the text file itself We'll take a look at the syntax of it. We'll put it in the proper location, which we'll have to figure out. And then we're just gonna do a simple um, web page URL test to see if the text file is available. All right, so how do we do that? Well, first off, we need the IIS uh, information uh, or internet information server manager tool. And on your web server, you're gonna have that, so you can find that here. And this is an example of what it looks like. This is on my own machine, but a very handy place to look at. And all your sites will be listed under the default site, uh, but your text file, your robots.txt file, will be actually placed at your default location for that site. And all you have to do is right-click on the default site uh, page under the connections pane here on the left-hand side, and just click Explore which opens up the path. And normally it's uh, for most IIS web servers, it is going to be um, on that server, unless it's been changed from default, the C drive and then INET pub, and then the www root folder. And as you can see, I've placed that robot text file right here. And that's, and you should see your robots text file. That file itself, if we edit it, uh, open up your editor, uh, double click on it in Windows, and whatever that syntax is, you'll find that there. So um, let's take a look at a very simple set of uh, syntax. This one has a comment. So just allow all public pages. Um, and I add that comment here. And then here's the special syntax. It's uh, user dash agent. Um, the syntax, again, like I said, not all web crawlers will understand this. So you might have to add different types of syntax for the user agents, and this just means all user agents, um, all web crawlers, so to speak. And then the option is disallow at this site. Uh, so basically the entire web link site is disallowed from being crawled, all right? Um, and there's other ways to do this. You could have web link, and then maybe there's a sub uh, area underneath this. You could put that path in here. You could have several uh, listings in here. The uh, syntax is found on the internet, like I said, and you can edit those uh, at any point, okay? So th in this case, uh, in my example, this is preventing the entire site, the entire web link site from being crawled. Uh, and that stops basically the uh, 
bot from attempting to do anything and log into the site and crawl through it and therefore keeps your uh, public portal licenses, those concurrent licenses, uh, from being used up. So if you are seeing a lot of usage by um, logins and you're and they just keep filling up and being used uh, every so often, um, and you're pretty certain that it's not really a, a person, uh, you might want to look into using this robots.txt file. Okay. Uh, now, how do we test it having added this in here? So, in fact, I'm going to copy this syntax because it actually wasn't um, uh, in this one. So, let's open up this file, put that in there, uh, go ahead and save that. And so, on our site, we just need to go to our web link site on this machine and do a test to see if robots.txt is there. Uh, how do we do that? Probably a pretty quick way to be honest would be to go to and then type in the name of that text file. And of course, I didn't type my URL correctly. So uh, make that a bit more proper. And then type in our URL and then type in robots.txt. Uh, that should bring that up. Make sure I copy that in case I have to retype it. And there you can see it's visible. Uh, so the all the pages in the site are disallowed, uh, even though I had put one setting, um, it's in there and automatically. So if you can see this, that means the bot, uh, the robots.txt file is available to the crawler and they'll read this and go in their merry way and skip you and not use up your logins. So that's how you test uh, your uh, configuration uh, preventing those bots by using that robots.txt file. Good stuff. All right, the next topic is how do we use workflow activities to automatically set or unset cutoffs for records that have been set? So this is a records management uh, functionality that is built into LaserFish workflow. Uh, for those who don't have records management edition, uh, this is not relevant to your system. It's an add-on that LaserFish provides for those who need to do formal document records management, retention and destruction. Uh, but um, in order to get documents to the point where they can be destroyed, they need to be, or in any sense, removed from the repository. They need to be put into a mode that LageFish calls cut off. Cut off just means the document is in its retention period and it is read only. Nobody can change it. And at the end of that retention period, something will happen to it. It'll either be destroyed or uh, stored off site and otherwise removed from the repository as well. Uh, although a copy is being made off-site rather than total destruction. So how do you set that up in LaserFish workflow? It is really easy uh, for any workflow process that you have. Go ahead and within that workflow itself, within the designer, uh, you'll go ahead and add, if we look under there, it's in the, um, if you type in the keyword for records, uh, you have the set records management properties activity. Uh, there's one activity, but it includes a whole host of actions. So for a, let's say an entry is uh, being called, you can have as many steps as you want, and then you can point this activity at that, either the starting entry or any other entry that's relevant. But on the right-hand side, if you see here on our screen, the select action choices, you have two options. You can cut off or uncut off, uh, a selected entry. Uh, the great tool uh, I, thing here is for any entry that is either event-based or any other method that is cut off, uh, when you uncut off or reverse the cutoff, I don't think there's an English language equivalent for uncut off, but uh, if you reverse the cutoff of a cutoff document or record, um, that removes the event date from that record as well. So if you have time-based cutoffs that uh, occurred, 
the event date will be removed as well because once you have an event date you can then cut off the record which then puts it into its retention period so uh, pretty straightforward there's nothing magical about this but this is a great workaround uh, a lot of times we will try and automate within records management as many things as we can with workflow now uh, just be aware if you look in this list do you see anything where you can do a disposition action can you destroy or other, otherwise uh, put into permanent retention or accessioning storing off-site that is uh, of any of the information here no you can do everything but that is a final manual step but as I show here uh, you can reverse the cutoff of any contents in the repository uh, and you can even build workflows that uh, do that on a selected document regardless so this could be its own workflow and you use it as a business process uh, in fact if we click here and you can make this workflow a business process which means a user could highlight a document and then just right click on the entry in the repository and run this workflow to uncut it off uh, without having to do anything special and theoretically not even have records management uh, rights and or be a records manager to do so uh, so an interesting solution available to you in laserfish workflow that would potentially allow you to uh, reverse the cutoff or set uh, cutoff conditions on an entry that's capable of being cut off uh, so if you have any questions or want to get further training on records management uh, automated activities we can set up uh, questions like that um, so within the laserfish workflow engine this activity is built into workflow it is free and workflow is free so your system has this built into workflow no additional uh, configuration needed uh, the only caveat being that uh, i think version 10.4 or maybe even 10.2 uh, was the minimum uh, let's see they went to flexible records management I i'm going to say 10.4 is the minimum um, but if you have any questions and uh, you don't see it in your version of workflow uh, let me know shoot me an email and uh, i'll be happy to uh, check that out and get back to you on that as far as which workflow is actually going to have that but the modern version 11 version 10.4 uh, has it for sure and um, uh, theoretically newer 10.3 should have it but uh, i that goes back quite a ways so if you're that far back um, one might consider getting an upgrade if uh, at all possible to the latest version um, i know sometimes you've got so many customizations and things that you don't want to upgrade that's okay you don't have to uh, but workflow actually is the one tool that you can theoretically update um, as long as the server has that uh, built into it so as long as your laserfish server supports uh, all these records management and has that licensed um, you know you can use the action obviously if you don't have records management licensed then the workflow is not going to be able to do anything because it's really irrelevant <laughs> so anyway that concludes our introduction um, so and uh, there's a question that's uh, in there um, thank you Jeff for your uh, entry about the robots.txt solution that you did and um, so if we have a really sophisticated solution that uh, needs to be put in place it looks like uh, we've done that for our clients from our development staff and uh, so we can um, we can do some customizations and make your life even easier than this uh, solution that i presented with the robots.txt file anyway uh, further resources for your knowledge and edification uh, Laserfish has a answers forum where you can post questions and just search for uh, answers to uh, esoteric questions that aren't necessarily found in the help files or anything you've seen online. Uh, a lot of questions are posed by both resellers and end users in this forum. So just go to answers.laserfish.com. You can get a free uh, Laserfish uh, site, uh, support site account if you don't have one already you'll just need to get your laserfish serial number which is in the about section of your uh, client and then uh, you can use that serial number along with your email address your company name and your name 
and you can get a free account and you can post questions in there and get subscribed to uh, different postings and topics and whatnot. LaserFish has a solutions exchange, which includes both free and paid for solutions uh, for various uh, uh, uses. You can get workflow solutions, you can get other add-ons that are uh, custom integrations, a really great site if you're curious, that's a great site to look at. And then LaserFish's support site, um, you can do laserfish.com slash support or support.laserfish.com. And again, if you don't have a uh, uh, login, that's okay. But if you do have a, and want to get a free site uh, login, you can then, once you have that, you can get additional content. Um, for example, you could get downloadable uh, updates uh, for LaserFish software. Uh, if you are going to update your software, um, don't just do it thinking there's no problems. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of uh, gotchas. So I do recommend reaching out to our support desk. Uh, which is at, it's just support at citiesdigital.com and uh, set up a pre-upgrade checklist and we can help you out uh, uh, to just make sure that you don't have any issues when doing that upgrade. All right. Uh, let's see. The And then finally, if you have any emails, uh, so you can uh, email me at uh, just kyle at citiesdigital.com uh, but also if you have questions regarding sales support or consulting uh, just use one of these email addresses here as listed and we appreciate all your questions and uh, ongoing support uh, at that so thank you so much everyone for your time today uh, again my name is kyle from cities digital that concludes our presentation for today Thanks as always from all of us here at CDI and have a great paperless day.